Am I on? I'm on. Good morning, ladies. First, I want to say a huge thank you on behalf of Lee Angel and Kim and myself for the beautiful way you honored us last week. That was really a surprise and a gift. We've all read our cards over and over, and our flowers still look beautiful a week later. Thank you, Susie, with the green thumb. But that was so kind. You know, we count this as an honor to get to prepare and teach like this, but the bonus is that you love on us so well and you encourage us. And so I just wanted to thank you for that. And it occurred to me um, when I spoke earlier that there were several ladies in here that probably don't know me from Adam. So I, I thought, I'm going to just tell you a little bit about me. And because uh, I always like to know a little bit about the person that's up there talking. Um, I was born in Little Rock, raised in Arkansas all my life, except for a year in Tennessee and four in Texas, but I got back as quick as I could. Um, I've been married to my college sweetheart, Paul, for 40 years this past August. We met at Washita Baptist University, where we both graduated in 1983, and I am an educator, to, uh, taught elementary uh, special education in North Little Rock. Thank you. Esther's not here today. Esther hired me. Esther Crawford hired me. Um, and then I homeschooled for 18 years. Um, when I have any spare time, <laughs> who has that? I love to read. Besides studying God's Word and all sorts of commentaries on God's Word, I love novels, biographies, mysteries, you name it. I just love to read. And I do a little writing too. We have three children that I birthed. Andrew is 36, Stephen is 33, and Sarah is 30. Um, Andrew, Susan, Evelyn, and Eleanor live in Jackson, Mississippi, where Andrew is an attorney, and Susan is a primary care doc. My son says the cartoon Bluey is his life, and he loves it. It's so precious. Um, Stephen, Allie, his wife, Jane, and Walker live in Little Rock, where Stephen works at Bank OZK, and Allie is a pharmacist pretty much just on fill-in now because she's also a full-time mommy. Stephen is likely to be the child that pays for his racing, just saying. Um, but he does have two adorable children. Um, our youngest, Sarah Catherine, who now goes by Catherine, or Cat now, recently moved to Middletown, Rhode Island, just a few miles away, where she is attending graduate school in mental health counseling and art therapy. Her dad asked her for a first day of classes photo, and this is what we got. So, But five years ago, God gave us a 16-year-old girl to come live with us, and she became our daughter as well. She has loving parents in Haiti, but we share her now. We're her American parents. Um, if you have time someday, I would love to tell you the story of how Mika came into our life and how she has woven herself into our hearts. And what a blessing and a gift she has been, especially to this mama's heart. She's a junior at Washita Baptist University, majoring in nursing. I am grateful to all the gifts that God has given to me and the plans he's made for my life. Even before I was born, he was already planning. But like each of you, it's not always been an easy path but he is very faithful. Let's pray before we start. Jesus, you know I want this to be about you and not about me. Not about the difficulties in getting to this day because you have provided. You are provider. You are my rock. You give me as your whole, and the word says the Holy Spirit will give you the words in that moment that you need them. And I, I claim that promise because you are faithful. You are true. You keep your promises. Father, as I uh, talk about prayer with these beautiful ladies, I pray that you would be glorified. Um, in your name, Jesus, amen. Okay, reforming prayer was the pillar that our author chose to pick out for us today. And it was about the reign of King Hezekiah. I love Hezekiah. Even, even warts and all, which we all have. But um, sisters, we could talk all day about prayer, couldn't we? 
so many things about prayer, intercessory prayer. Should we pray in our closet or should we pray with others? All the things we could cover. We could never begin to cover the subject of prayer. But as my father does every time, he helped me nail it down and bring it in by teaching me. You know, if any of you have ever taught a class, taught a Sunday school, taught a group or a large group like this, you know that you have to learn the lesson first. And so um, several months ago, I picked up this book, or actually, I guess I ordered this book. It sounded interesting. It was about a man who was wanted to be in constant prayer, wanted to be praying without ceasing. And it was very encouraging and very challenging until it wasn't. <laughs> then it became this, I can't do this. And, you know, throw it across the room and go, I can't do that, Lord. And he says, you know, Cheryl, I'm not asking you to be that person. He had a very different life than you. But it did encourage me to say, Lord, show me how to pray without ceasing and how to be a woman of prayer. And here are some of the things he's been teaching me as I opened up to, to do uh, this lesson. First thing is what prayer is. Prayer is a privilege. A privilege. You know, when I began looking back at the king, good kings of Judah, I think there was a clear reminder to us of how privileged we are to live in New Testament times. And as we spent time in God's words this week, we saw where King Hezekiah was a praying king. There were several times in both 2 Kings and 2 Chronicles where it indicated that he cried out to Yahweh in prayer. But then I thought, what about the, uh, the six other kings before him? So believe it or not, I went back and read all the scripture of the six kings before him to say, what, what happened here? Did they pray also? How much of that? was recorded there. So here's what I found. Asa and Jehoshaphat. There were scripture in 2 Chronicles 14, 11. Asa says, I, he cried out to the Lord. Jehoshaphat, look in your Bibles at 2 Chronicles 25 through 12, or just jot it down if you want to look later. Wonderful prayer. I mean, he had a prayer recorded in God's word. It began with, he stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem, and said, O oh Lord, God of our fathers, and then skip down to 12, and this is my favorite prayer now. This is my, my go-to prayer. O oh Lord, God of our fathers, we do not know what to do, but our eyes are in you. What a great prayer. Yay, Jehoshaphat. I love that. So mark that in your Bible. Put that on a card, Kim. And, and just remember, what, when you don't know what to do, how many of you know what to do every, t no, yeah, okay. Oh, Lord God of our fathers, we do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. Now, Joash and Amaziah, I could not find anywhere where they actually prayed a prayer or where it was recorded. Now, I'm not saying they didn't pray or that, you know, they didn't follow, it, they were good kings, but there was nothing recorded in there specifically. And we know they struggled. Little, little Joash, six years old when he became king, you know, he kind of depended on Jehoiada, his father figure and his priest to tell him what to do. But Uzziah in 2 Chronicles 20, it's getting blurry for some reason. 2 Chronicles 26, 5, he set himself to seek God in the days of Zechariah, he said. And Jotham in 2 Chronicles 27, 6, says he ordered his ways before the Lord his God. But think about what a struggle it must have been to the people at this time in history. Most of them were dependent on the priests, the prophets, and the king to lead them and teach them about Yahweh. Am I correct? We didn't have a Bible. You, you didn't have a local church building you went into. If they had good kings, godly priests, and truthful prophets, which didn't always happen, then they stood a chance. But that was not always the case, as we know. Sometimes there were good kings, but maybe a false prophet. Or, whatever, or the priests were not, the priests were doing whatever the king wanted them to do. Just think about what they had to deal with. But prayer for us as 21st century believers in Jesus Christ is such a privilege. 
through the power of the Holy Spirit of God and because of the perfect life he lived and the sacrifice he made on the cross, we have the privilege of coming directly to the throne of God. We don't require a priest to give us forgiveness for our sins, although you might want your priest or your pastor to pray for you. We don't have to bring a bull or a ram or doves or whatever to be sacrificed on an altar for our sin. Jesus took care of that. We do not have to, okay. We do not have to wait a whole year to be able to worship because we can do it every week. They had a temple in Jerusalem. They traveled once a year. In Hebrews 4, 15 and through 16, it says, we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses. We have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. I want to read something really quick to you. I don't know if, any, if y'all have heard about this young woman. Her name is Isabel Spruce. She's from the UK. And uh, this is an old article. I tried to find the newer one because there has been things happen in her case. But just real quick, the title of it is The UK Considers a Nationwide Ban on Silent Prayers Near Abortion Facilities. This is not made up. This is true. Just before Christmas, a pro-life volunteer and leader of UK's March for Life was arrested and charged with four counts of praying silently on a public street near a closed abortion facility in the UK. A closed abortion utility. She's out there praying silently. At least five areas of the UK have implemented measures that prevent any person from approving or disapproving of abortion, including through silent prayer within a censorship zone. And Parliament may soon consider a national ban on expressing opinions near an abortion facility. These measures are a violation of the most basic rights to freedom of speech and thought. And then it goes on and on. And she talks about how faith is so central to her life is that she couldn't help but go and pray. And she'd done this for years. But suddenly, let's crack down. What a privilege we have to pray But things could change, but they can't stop us from what's in our head, can they? Praying to God is now now begins with a personal relationship with the God of the universe through Jesus. It's not a performance thing. It's a personal thing. What a privilege. But next under that what prayer is, is I wanted to point out what a great plan this has been from the beginning. This is God's great plan. From the very beginning, it was God's plan to have a close, intimate, conversational relationship with the humans that he created. In the first few chapters of Genesis, God speaks to man and he gives him instructions. And he probably had many, many conversations. I had to do some real good thinking this week and think, what would Adam and God have talked about? And then once Eve came along, you know, what did they talk about? But you think about... They could have talked about the uniquenesses and the beauty of what God had created. But God didn't make a robot. God made an intelligent human being so that he could fellowship with him. I am certain, though, that Adam had at least a million questions. Eve had 10 million, right? And you know what? I'm sure God patiently answered everyone. We do not know how long they had before the fall. It could have been years, could have been days. We don't know. It doesn't matter. The thing is, he made us for relationship. He wants us to talk with him. He says, call on me and I will answer you and tell you great and mighty things that you do not know. Um, Well, then, you know, he's talking with Adam and he's telling Adam to name the animals and all the things. And then he creates woman. And you know that brought up a lot of conversations about how different she was going to be from him, but how special and how she was going to make everything beautiful and she was going to have lots to say and that you better listen to her. <laughs> and we know that they were very accustomed to walking and talking with God. How do we know this? 
Genesis 3, 8 and 9. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. They knew what that sounded like. Oh, God's walking in the garden. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And the Lord called to the man and said, where are you? Adam and Eve were very accustomed to walking and talking with Yahweh. They knew his voice. They had walked and talked and listened to the wisdom he gave for probably quite some time. They probably, when they would hear him, would run to be with him, don't you think? They were unashamed and sinless and in perfect communication until they weren't. It was always God's idea to be in communion with us. Isn't that wonderful? It's a privilege and it's God's great plan. Let's talk about what God taught me next. How prayer should begin. How should prayer begin? This is one of those things that God has drawn attention to in my prayer life in the last few years. I was taught as a young Southern Baptist girl, anybody any here with me, to P-R-A-Y. Praise him, repent, ask, and yield. That was kind of a, anybody else here? Anybody else? Here? Oh, good, good, good. Um, and you know, a lot of times the praise would be very quick and then it would be to the repent. And then it would be to the ask, 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 ask. And then by the time I got to yield, it was like, I got to go. I'm out the door. That happens sometimes. But Jesus' disciples, when they were with him and they said, Lord, teach us how to pray, he said, I'm going to tell you. I'm going to give you this example. And so in Matthew 6, 9 and 10, here's how he said to start off. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He started off praising who he was and and put it on him. We're here for you. I'm here for you. I'm praying to you. Two things to look at at in this example. The first thing is we should do is take the time to acknowledge his holiness and remember who we are speaking to. Hallowed be your name. We don't use the word hallowed that much anymore, although there's a hallow app now that you can, that's a prayer app because holy is basically what it is. The definition of hallowed is greatly revered and honored. Do you greatly revere and honor God when you come into his presence to pray? It's very important that we do that. Hallowed always means, also means set apart, holy, and consecrated. When we come into his presence, he is to be greatly reverenced, worshiped, honored, and adored. Only he is worthy to be praised and worshiped. No one else, no other gods, no other person. Jesus set the example, not just in this one example prayer that he gave him, but in Matthew eleven twenty five, 25, he says, at that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. So he began another prayer with, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, naming something about him, naming his greatness. Um, Remember when Jesus was about to raise Lazarus from the dead? And instead of just telling Lazarus, okay, come on out, I have the power, which he did. He could have just said, hey, watch this. Come on out, Lazarus. Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. Jesus could have just said, hey, come on out, but he had, he took the time to praise his father and put the attention on him, didn't he? He glorified the one who created us and hears us and sees us and who had it as his plan all along for us to walk and talk with him. I encourage you to take the time to praise first, even when it's a quick prayer for a friend or a cry of desperation, when you anticipate a difficult situation, or even when you just want to express what's on your heart, you're sad or grieving 
are confused. Lord, you are Jehovah Rapha. So I lift my hands to you, my heart to you, and say, would you bring healing to this friend who's going through this difficult time? He is Jehovah Rapha. Father, you are sovereign and trustworthy, so we're going to trust you with the elections this year because you're sovereign and you're trustworthy and you've got it all under control. Lord, you are omniscient. You know all things, and so guide me because I don't know all things and I need your omniscience in my life. Okay, the second thing I want you to notice about how Jesus referred to God uh, is that Jesus referred to God as Father. That doesn't seem unusual to us as New Testament Christians. But in the book, Prayer, Conversing with God, and I have to tell you about this book. Anybody else have this book, Prayer, Conversing with God by Rosalind Rinker? Go back in your bookshelves and see. You might have gotten this. I received this book. When I was 14 years old, November 4th, 1975, from our youth pastor at the time in Fort Smith, Arkansas, and we did like a little prayer retreat with this book. Pulled it out the other day, well, a couple weeks ago, and just started flipping through it. Oh my goodness, it's so full of good things. So I put that, I think I put that at the bottom of your handout. Let me tell you, she wrote this in 1959, two years before I was born. I have it so marked up, and it's falling apart. I'm going to glue it up really good. But this was the 41st printing in 1975. It's still in print. So get you a copy. It's probably $5 on Amazon. But, it, I mean, it's just a little pamphlet, but it is, it is good. Maybe, maybe if you don't need it, somebody else could, be, could benefit. But it is, in fact, it is number one in Christianity's today's top 50 books that have shaped evangelicals. Isn't that wild? And I had it in my bookshelf all these years. Didn't even realize it. Well, in this chapter that I want to read this one little bit, um, she's giving a beautiful explanation about who we should pray to. God in three persons. Do we pray to God the Father, God the Son, or God the Holy Spirit? Well, he is one. So, But the, but the thing I wanted to point out about God, Jesus calling God Father is this. It says, Jesus Christ himself taught us, mainly in the Gospel of John, that he and the Father are one. Jesus Christ is the Father defined. No one called God Father before Jesus came. No one knew what God was really like until Jesus came to the earth and show himself as he really is. This caught me a little off guard because I thought, what do you mean he didn't refer to him as Father? Turns out I went to my um, research app called Google and did me a little research on this. And according to Baker's Evangelical Dictionary of Biblical Theology, it sounded real official, and, I, and there was actually several that said this same thing, Father is used for God only 15 times in the Old Testament. And generally, those passages are talking about his nature. He is like a father to his children. Only one person in the Old Testament actually speaks to him, calling him father. Any guesses? Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, and he only does it twice. God longs for his children to call him father. In Jeremiah 319, God says, how gladly would I treat you like my children and give you a pleasant land, the most beautiful inheritance of any nation. This is speaking to the children of Israel. I thought you would call me father and not turn away from following me. He longed for the nation of Israel to call him father and let him bless them. But they kept turning. We kind of do that too, don't we? Well, here's the part I like the best though. Jesus calls God father over 165 times. Go, and, and I didn't go count them. I just trust in the research here. But think about that. Jesus referred to him as father constantly. That must have been so puzzling. Now, I never thought of that until this week. That must have been so puzzling to them. He calls him like dad, like Abba. Don't you know that was exciting? So to review, prayer is a privilege and God's great plan. And how should it begin? With praise to the father who is worthy of all praise. 
Okay. I think this is the third one. What prayer requires. Yeah, this is the next last one. It requires lots of things, really. Time, patience, reverence, determination, truth, just to name a few. But today I want to focus on the Hebrew word first mentioned in the book of Exodus. Mishkan. Mishkan. And this is an other book I think I put at the bottom in case you want. This is an awesome book that I've been through. Kim is enjoying it now. It, it just amazing what you'll find in here. And I'm on the wrong page. What page are we on? Mishkan. Did I tell you on there? 237. Okay. All right. Mishkan. Thank you for your patience. Okay, I'm going to read to you a little bit about Mishkan. Mishkan. Um, the teacher and his student were talking. And the teacher says to his student, how would you define prayer? Prayer is to talk to God, I said, to bring him our needs and requests. Well, that's a part of prayer, he said, but it's more than that. The tabernacle was Israel's central place of prayer. But it was never called the tabernacle. That's what we call it. What was it called? It was called the Mishkan. Mishkan comes from the Hebrew root word shakan. Shakan means to dwell. So Mishkan means the dwelling. The Mishkan was the tent or the tabernacle that would allow God to dwell with his people. Remember, he told them how to build the, the tent and the tabernacle, and he would come, his spirit would come and dwell with the people. That was as close as they got to having him dwelling. It was also the central place of prayer. So prayer is linked to the dwelling of God. The Mishkan wasn't the only dwelling place of God. It was also called the tent of meeting. It's where God and man met together. You see, prayer is not just an action. It's a meeting. It's an encounter. The Mishkan was not only where God dwelt, but man dwelt there too. Prayer is not primarily about us saying words or performing an act. It is a Mishkan. It's about dwelling. It's the dwelling of God and man together. So the deepest part of prayer is that of dwelling in the dwelling of God, being present in the presence of God. And to dwell is more than just saying the words of a prayer or singing the songs of a, words of a song and then being finished. Okay, I've done my thing. Prayer is to dwell in the presence of God. Mishkan also means remaining, continuing, abiding, and the inhabiting. What then is at the heart of prayer? To abide in his abiding, to remain in his remaining, to rest in his resting, and to inhabit his habitation. To know what prayer truly is, you must go deeper. You must enter the Mishkan. Isn't that great? Um, God and human meeting together, Mishkan, to dwell in his presence. In 2017, I read the sacred Enneagram. Anybody know your Enneagram number? I have no clue what mine is. I have no clue. Read the whole book. Don't know. I, I forgot it as soon as that started. But the whole book, price of the whole book was worth this one section about prayer and how Prayer, in addition to being a dwelling, a mishkan, an abiding with him, it needs to be done with a certain attitude. And I'm going to put on, it's solitude, silence, and stillness. I'm going to read just a little bit about each of these. And I am not one that can sit still for very long. I usually like something going on in the background. But that has changed with me since I read this back in 2017. I know that I cannot dwell and go deep and abide and just rest in him unless I do these three things. So the whole book was worth this one thing. 
solitude. Lots of us are surrounded by people all the time. Not all of us. I'm not that way. But even when we aren't physically present with each other, our days are punctuated with texts, tweets, emails, social media, all the things. Yet somehow people still feel deeply and profoundly lonely. Solitude, intentional withdrawal, teaches us to be present, present to ourselves and present to God and present to others. Solitude, by yourself. Silence. We're constantly distracted. There's so much noise in our lives from emails, texts, and phone calls and all the things. Our attention is always being interrupted. I got onto my sweet little Mika because she had her little, all of her notifications for everything she's even on. Every app she's on sends her notifications. So she's constantly doing this. She'd just be talking all of a sudden. She'd go, and, and I'm like, that is interruptions. We do not need that. I don't do that. I don't, none of mine come through. I don't want anybody to bother me. But it, <laughs> I'm doing well just to get along. No, but, but that is something that people are dealing with on, in a, on a level that we've not seen in, in our lifetime. But in silence, we hear the truth that God is not as hard on us as we are on ourselves. Can I get an Amen. You know, you can just be beating yourself down and you're just, uh, and you get quiet and you listen to the voice of God and he wants to tell you things. He wants to tell you how beloved you are to him, how much he cares about you, how much he has a plan for your day, your week, your entire life. So we need to get by ourselves and silent. And this is the tough one for me, getting still. Ooh, it's that ADD kicking in. We live in a cause-driven age. We have activists, we have causes, we have volunteers, we have all these things, and we feel like sometimes we need to be doing all the things. It seems all of us want to do good in this world. We want to help. But in many ways, the world's getting worse, not better. This is their words, despite our best intentions. We also live in a time when productivity and impact feed the lives that we believe about ourselves. The constant pressure to do more, fill up our schedules, work harder, but then we have to stop that busyness or we'll be stopped by burnout and exhaustion. Stillness teaches us restraint. In restraint, we are able to discern and hear God's voice about what we are to do, what we are to engage in. Now, I have to clarify that praying without ceasing, obviously, means you, can't, you just can't stop and be still and quiet. And, you know, there's times, and like I said, we could talk about different aspects of prayer all day. Obviously, there are times where, you know, you're just driving along and you have to just stop and send up a prayer. Maybe, you're, maybe there's a four-year-old in the back seat saying, me, 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 like this morning. <laughs> or, you know, there's distractions that you cannot get rid of. But when we take the time to really abide, get quiet before him, get still and in silence. You can pray anytime, anywhere about anything and he hears you and he sees you, no doubt. But prayer that involves dwelling, being present in his presence will require setting aside time that you necess don't necessarily have. Nothing is more important. It's another neat book I have, 31 Days of Prayer by Ruth Myers. I want to share. She shares in here a quote by a known, well-known devotional writer. I'd never heard of him, but that doesn't mean anything. S.D. Gordon. He says, the great people of the earth today are those people who pray. I do not mean those who talk about prayer, nor those who say that they believe in prayer, nor yet those who can explain all about prayer, but I mean those people who take time and pray. They don't have time. It must be taken from something else. This something else is important, very important and pressing, but still less important and less pressing than prayer. Mm, got me. 
What prayer does, this is the last one and then we're going to close. What prayer does, if we see prayer as the incredible gift and privilege that it is, and we spend time praising him and acknowledging him as father, the one who wants us to come to him and call him father. And when we can seek solitude and silence and stillness so that we can dwell with him, then what does prayer do? It changes us. How? Lots of ways. As we pray, as we dwell with him, as I mentioned a while ago, you know, he, can, he speaks truth to us. When we speak truth, we are talking to truth. He is truth. He is love. He is all the things. Prayer, as it changes us, it takes, us, takes away fear. Fear about the future. Fear, uh, fear about the prodigal that you want to return, that there's no sign right now they're returning. It takes away that fear. It takes away fear of things like elections or governments or wars or anything else going on. There is no fear in Jesus. As we dwell, as we abide in him and spend that time with him, he'll take away that fear. It changes us by sustaining us. Everything we need is found in him. Everything. It humbles and encourages us. Aren't you glad for both of those? Maybe not so much the humbling thing, but as he convicts us, as he teaches us and says, you know, we got to work on this. This is keeping you from being the effective godly woman I want you to be. Let's work on this. He doesn't do it angrily. He loves us. He's so gentle. He's so sweet. So good to us. But then he encourages us. He doesn't say, well, you did it again. You failed again. In fact, I'm giving up on you. You never hear that from your father. How does it change us? It increases our trust in his plans and in his timing. It increases our trust in him. The more I have sought to be in a spirit of prayer all day long, and I, I'll get to the end of the day some days and go, wow, that didn't go well. But then I'll have days where I just feel like, oh, we're talking all day long. But the glory goes to him because he was able to get my attention back. And, and, and he, I can't do it perfectly. You can't do it perfectly. We can't pray perfectly. But when we remember that it's a dwelling with him, he is perfection. He will speak to us and say the things we need to hear. And he will humble us sometimes in prayer. He'll say, mm -mm, we've got to work on this. But he always encourages and we can trust him. Prayer changes us. Let's pray. Father, thank you for prayer. Thank you and praise you that you're the one who thought of it. You're so creative. You're so relational. You didn't create robots. You created intelligent human beings because you wanted communion with us. You wanted to dwell with us. What a privilege. Don't let us ever forget what a privilege it is to come to you. Come into your presence. Come boldly before your throne and know that we will not be ignored. We will not be forsaken. We will be seen and heard and you will speak to us. Oh, you're so good. Thank you for the privilege of prayer. Teach us every day how to come into better prayer and dwelling and abiding relationship with you. We give it to you because you are the one who produces the good in us. It's all about you. In the mighty, precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen.